Welcome back. Uh, today, in the uh, continuous series of the microscopic valences, we shall be looking more into this aspect and we shall now see the what are the kinds of uh, modeling assumptions we make and what are their effects on the uh, balance equations. So, first is the shape of the control volume and as we have seen in our earlier lecture that depending on the shape of the control volume, we have to choose the appropriate coordinate system. For example, if we have a rectangular or a cuboid structure, then we will choose rectangular coordinate. If we have some cylindrical structure, generally we go by cylindrical coordinate and if we have some spherical structure, we go by the spherical coordinate. Now, in this case, you must be very careful in understanding that when we talk of the control volume and when we talk of the actual system, these two may not be the same. That means, that whenever you are studying some system, you choose the control volume may be within the system, because your focus may be on the particular domain of the overall system. So, depending on which domain is, is our interest, the uh, shape of the control volume will depend on that particular domain and not on the physical boundary of the actual system. And this particular point, I also explained to you in earlier lecture, when I told you that suppose you have a sphere and in the sphere, we define generally two boundaries, one at the center of the sphere and at the periphery of the sphere. But uh, in actually, there is only one boundary that is the um, uh, at the periphery of the sphere. So, for mathematical purpose, we define two boundaries that is for the control volume. We define two boundaries, one at the center and one at the periphery. So, similarly, you can see that depending on what you want to study, in what region you want to make the studies, you have to choose the appropriate shape of the control volume and depending on the shape of the control volume, you have to choose the appropriate coordinate system. Next, we come to the size of the control volume. Now, the control volume size will depend on how much you want to study. Like earlier when we were talking about the macroscopic and balances and the, uh, in, the in that what we found that in the macroscopic balance, when we were uh, doing the overall system we are looking into and we also assumed that all the properties are having some average value or some uh, or single value. So, in that case, we put the size at the overall uh, system, where we were not really bothered about the distribution or the profile of any of the extensive or intensive properties. On the other hand, when we went to the microscopic balance, what we did, we uh, uh, disintegrated the whole big system into small, small pieces and then we started looking into what is happening in that particular small or what we call the infinite small control volume. So, in that way you see that depending on the size of the con control volume, we will be having different types of information. And in case of microscopic balances, we choose a very small size of the control volume over which we make the balance equations or apply the conservation laws and then look at the whole domain to find out how the particular uh, variable like temperature, concentration, etc are varying over the control volume. Okay. And this is first. And second thing is this, that when we go for the selection of the boundary conditions, that is this size is very important to us. Why? Because some many a times we say that we have infinite boundary. Now, how do we realize this infinite boundary? It is not that any physical domain will have some kind of finiteness. Infinite means that the, the uh, re with respect to the region of our study, the boundaries of the physical system may be very far away. In that case, what we do, we many a times neglect the effect of the uh, boundary which is far away from the 
control volume of our study or interest. Okay. In that respect, we can say that at the far boundary, we sometimes assume that the particular variable is having some constant value or we can also assume the flux of the particular variable is zero. Uh, that means, we may either assume a Dirichlet boundary condition or we may assume a um, uh, Neumann boundary condition. Now, zero I just give you for example, it may also have some non-zero values as well. Okay? So, um, that means, the infinite volume in a mathematical term is given in term, uh, will be given in terms of the size of the control volume of our interest. Next comes the phases in the system. Many times we find that we are dealing with not single phase, but many phases, multiple phases. Phases means we may be having liquid uh, with solid and then gas or vapor. Now, you see that for example, if you talk of a um, liquid evaporating from some vessel into the atmosphere. Here we find that uh, there will be um, in the liquid phase, one liquid phase and from that liquid phase and the vapor phase is getting generated. Okay. Similarly, suppose you are uh, heating some liquid on some oven, then what we find that from the bottom of the vessel, we find that vapor bubbles are formed and which then move through the liquid. So, in that case what we find that initially which was a single phase system, we are generating two phase system. Now, these two phase characteristics will be different from the single phase characteristics. That means, when you want to know the, the temperature distribution within this particular liquid. Now, when the liquid is in single phase, you will find due to this heat, there will be a certain uh, temperature distribution. On the other hand, when there are two phases, that means the bubbles are now getting generated in the liquid, you will find that the uh, temperature distribution has got affected because uh, there will be now some uh, energy interactions between the bubble uh, or the gas and the liquid, due to which the temperature profile will now change. Okay? So, that is why we have to be very careful to understand the effects of the various types of phases involved and please understand that while the process is going on, <coughs> there will be a number of phases may change. Like I have given the example of the boiling of the liquid, uh, on the conversely you can also think like this that a liquid is suppose flowing through a pipeline and sub, imagine that the pipeline is exposed to a very low temperature and that low temperature is lower than the freezing point of the liquid. Then what will you see? That as the liquid is flowing through the pipeline, you will find that maybe after certain time or after certain after traversing certain length of the pipeline, the liquid now get frozen. In that respect also you will find that two phases are getting generated from a single phase. Okay. So, in this manner you will find that in our day to day <coughs> life, many processes are there where it is involving their phase changes. Okay. And whenever there is a phase change, you will find that you have multiple phases to account for and when you want to know the temperature distribution or concentration distribution or the velocity distribution in each of the phases, you have to write this momentum balance, the energy balance and the uh, mass balance for each of those phases separately, so that you can get the profiles of the concentration, velocity and the temperature in each of the phases. Okay? That is one. Second thing is this, many times whenever you are using some kind of reactor, we find that in the reactor we are using uh, maybe some catalytic reactor we have and we have some catalysts which are generally in solid phase and through this catalyst bed we find that the reactants are flowing. The reactants may be in the liquid phase or may be in the gaseous phase. Okay? So, whatever it is you will find that <coughs> they are flowing and some reaction is happening through this. Now, if you want to know the temperature distribution within the catalyst. Okay? Then in that case, you will write an energy balance for the catalysts, okay? for the bed. If you want to know the temperature distribution in the liquid or the gas, 
you have to write an energy balance separately for that. Also, you mind it that when you look at the overall uh, microscopic balance, like the Navier-Stokes equation, you will find that many of the terms, all the terms may not be important for uh, each of the phases. If, for example, in the solid phase, if the solid is considered to be remaining static, in that case what you find? The solid will remain static, so it will not be moving. So, any kind of velocity associated with the solid will be neglected. That means, there will not be any convective heat flow by the solid. Okay? So, for the solid, it is only the conductive heat flow. So, when you look at the, uh, the energy balance equation, you, will, you can easily neglect all the convective terms and you will be having only the conductive term with you. And upper, apart from this, you may have some source term depending on whether there is any kind of energy interaction between the um, uh, mass within the packed bed and outside or between the um, solid and the gaseous phase. Okay. So, this kind of source terms will come. So, similarly, when you look at the liquid or gaseous phase, in that case you find that you cannot neglect the convective terms. Now, also we know that for the liquids and gases, the conductive terms are generally negligible in comparison to the convective terms. So, if that is the case, in that case you again see that you can simplify the energy balance equations by simply dropping all the conductive terms and retaining only the convective term. Okay? So, in this way you see that by considering the kind of phase involved in the particular process, you are able to neglect many terms and that is how you are able to simplify a three dimensional equation maybe to one dimensional equation. Okay? Similarly, you can do this kind of analysis for many other purposes. For example, if you want to know that how the, uh, the some pollutants are getting distributed in the air. Many a times you find from the industries, you have, might have found a chimney and from there you find that some plume gases are coming out and especially if you pass by some refinery or some fertilizer plant or some other chemical plant, you will find that something is coming out on top. And what you find? Sometimes you find they are dark colored, black colored plumes are coming out. What are basically? They are basically the carbons. Okay. Similarly, many other gases also come out from these industries and they get into the atmosphere. Now, many a times you find that we are talked, uh, we to, uh, are told about the acid drain, etc. Now, what are these? What, these are nothing but the emissions which are happening from these sources, maybe industrial sources, they are getting trapped by the moisture which is getting frozen in the cloud and those things like you know, some nitrous oxide or some sulfurous oxide, those things are getting trapped and now they are coming back to the earth as what we call the acid rain. Okay? In that case also, when you want to know that how these um, uh, pollutants are getting distributed in the atmosphere, how they are getting trapped or frozen by the atmospheric moisture. All these things when you want to study, this you can study very well with these balance equations. And in that case, as I have just given you the example, if you uh, understand the particular system, you can simplify a uh, 3D equation to maybe a 2D or 1D equation that is going to help you to get a very good understanding. It is not that by simplification, you may not be always getting uh, bad results. It is not so, because you may find that even if you are considering some 3D problem and you are not simplifying it, you may find that ultimately the result you are obtaining after so much of effort is, is no, no better than what you are getting by solving for a 1D problem. Okay? So, it is always our uh, intention to see to it that how we can simplify a 3D equation to 1D or 2D. Okay? Here, I am not touching upon the unsteady state part or steady state part because that will depend only on the whether the process is steady or unsteady. So, that is not a big concern for us. Only this in modeling these um, 3D uh, the simplification generally comes by having the 3D to 2D. 
Okay, so that is why I explained that how the phases of the system um, are important uh, factors in having some um, simplification in the model equations. Next comes the flow conditions. Now, flow conditions means that what kind of velocity field we um, are envisaging. Okay? Now, it may be so that um, in general you will find that whenever the flow is happening, we know that velocity is a three dimensional field. Okay? But many a times under situations will be there, like for example, if there is a flow through a pipe and it is fully developed. Okay? And if we assume that there is a, a proper mixing and there is no axial transfer of any uh, anything, any solute or something, then we can might as well say that at a given cross section of the pipeline, the there is only one uh, velocity. Okay? So, that sometimes we call that velocity as a superficial velocity. Okay? So, in that case, if, if we can assume that this velocity is uniform over the whole cross section, then you can see that as the fluid is moving, okay, there is only one velocity which matters to us. And this kind of thing we call it the plug flow. Plug flow, you can imagine it is something like a flow which you find in a um, syringe system, like whenever you are having the injection syringes, okay, you can see that the you have put the plunger inside to drive out the particular in, uh, injectant. Okay? So, that is the kind of thing that as if the whole fluid is without any kind of uh, flow distribution, any kind of axial distribution, the whole fluid is going like a plug. Okay? And, and if we can assume it is a plug flow, then what happens that our whole 3D momentum balance equations reduce to only 1D momentum balance equation. Okay? So, that is the important and that is very important simplification we are doing. Another simplification may be done in some <coughs> cylindrical coordinate. In that what happens that many a times that in a cylindrical coordinate we can assume that there is axial symmetry. And what I mean by that axial symmetry? It means that suppose you have a cylinder with a axis at the from the center at the cylinder. Okay? Axial symmetry means that, that if you move along the azimuthal direction that is theta direction in a cylindrical coordinate, any particular value of say temperature or velocity or something, they will not be changing if you kind rotate along a given radius and a given axial position. This is important for you to know that you have to keep suppose r theta z we are talking about at a given r and at a given z. Okay, if you change theta like this, you will find that the particular value is not changing. Okay, this we call axial symmetry. That means it is symmetrical about the axis. So if you can assume that symmetry, then what you find that you are able to neglect any derivative with respect to theta. Okay, so this also coming by the kind of the flow conditions you have, so you are able to make that kind of simplifications. Okay, but understand this may not be true all the times. There are some, and you have to be very careful whenever you are making such kind of simplifications. You should be very careful. And the last one is the mixing condition. Now, what is mixing? Mixing means that we are trying to have we, we in mixing we have at least two species and these two species will be kind of going into each other. That is uh, uh, very crudely we can define mixing. Okay. Now, suppose we uh, in our day to day life we are mixing so many things. For example, you are mixing sugar in the milk, sugar in the tea, okay, and sugar in the coffee. So, this is mixing problem. When we are cooking something, we are mixing the spices in our dishes. Okay. So, we in our day to day life, we are having so many examples of mixing. Even we are mixing for heat transfer, we are mixing say hot water in cold water, so that we can um, use it properly. Because if it is too hot, then we may not be able to use it. If it is too cold also, we may not be able to use it. So, some many a times we mix a hot water with cold water to come to bring to a temperature that can be we can handle. Okay. So, the, all these are examples of mixing. Now, what does mixing do? Whenever there is mixing, mixing tries to break 
any kind of profile of temperature or velocity or concentration. Without mixing, suppose as I, if you look at this, that if you put some sugar in milk and if you do not stir it, that means you are not mixing it, then what will happen? That you will find that it will take some time. And how do you know that it will take some time for mixing? Because if you test the uh, milk from the top surface, you will find that you are not, it is not testing sweet. Okay? But if you give enough time, you will find that from the top surface, if you take some sample out, the sweetness is increasing. It means that the sugar has started dissolving in the milk. Okay? So, this initial, that means what happened that if you are not stirring it, we can say there will be a gradient of the sweetness. And this sweetness is nothing but an indication of the concentration of the sugar or the glucose in the particular system, in the milk. Okay? So, you have to look in that fashion. So, sweetness is nothing but the um, kind of expression of the concentration of the, because you cannot see sugar, you cannot see the salt, but you can test them to figure out that whether their concentration is more or less. Okay? Now, without stirring, you find that suppose you could take a sample right near from the sugar, sugar lump where it's sitting, it's sitting at the bottom of the particular container, you would find that the sweetness near the sugar lump is more than the sweetness near the surface of the particular container. That will tell you that there is a gradient of the concentration of the sugar molecules within the particular milk. Okay? Now, when you stir it, what happens? You know for your, from your day to day observation that as, as you stir it with a spoon, what happens? You find that you are able to mix the sugar in the milk very fast. And what you find? That if you, now you do not bother really to where to taste it from. You can taste from any depth of the particular milk and you will find the sweetness is the same. Okay, whether you take from the bottom of the container or from the surface of the container, you find the sweetness is the same. What it indicates? It indicates that a stirring has helped in mixing of the sugar with the milk and that has brought the whole system at an uniform sweetness that is uniform concentration of the sugar. Now, when you have this kind of situation where mixing is proper mixing is there, that means you can neglect any kind of gradient within the system. Okay? Now, this I have given the example from, from the point of view of the species or mass, uh, mass balance. Okay? Similar thing you can also extend for energy balance. As I have told you the given example of mixing hot water with cold water. Okay? You can might as well take some say cold liquid and if from the tap you can just have some hot water coming. You will find that it is taking longer time for the system to reach uniform temperature. But on the other hand, if you stir this whole system, you will find the system is coming to a uniform temperature earlier. Okay? So, all these are examples of the role of mixing in breaking the profile or the gradient of the properties and bringing the whole system at a single value. Okay, now, what is its effect on the modeling? Now, when you have this kind of system, when you have proper mixing, you can neglect all the distributions of the properties like velocity, temperature, concentration of species with respect to the coordinate directions. That means, for example, you can say there is no gradient in x direction, y direction, z direction. So, you can see that how easily if you look at again the Navier-Stokes equation, you will find all the dou by dou x, dou by dou y, dou by dou z, all these terms are going to 0. So, that means that is the effect of the mixing. Okay? Now, you understand one thing that I am saying that dou by dou x, dou by dou by dou y, it does not mean that the velocity will not be there. It will be there, but it will be having a constant value. It is not, I am not making the velocity value to be 0. I am just making their gradient to be 0. So, understand the difference between the gradient and the absolute value of the particular um, property. 
okay so gradient zero does not mean that the value of the particular uh, property or the variable is coming to zero only thing is this by having this mixing assumption we are able to get rid of all kind of spatial derivatives of the system and that is how we are able to simplify the whole system okay so with this particular uh, this modeling assumptions uh, i hope that you have got fairly good idea that how you can simplify a, a 3d equation to a maybe 2d or maybe to 1d system and that is going to help you out in uh, simplifying your solution for the system okay in our next lecture we shall be now taking some uh, examples and show you how we apply all these assumptions okay for our many commonly observed phenomena so uh, these are the references which uh, you can uh, refer to to get more idea about all the aspects that i have touched thank you